So it's, um, we good? All right. My, my pleasure to welcome everybody here uh, this evening for the last lecture of this, this year's 22-23 Forum Lecture Series. As you can see, um, we are at number six. Thanks for uh, the many of you who have been here throughout the series. It's been a really wonderful series and a real privilege to be involved in it this year. Um, so we've, we've dealt with a variety of issues. We, uh, I think we started this series talking about um, the three areas of focus in the school, which are uh, architectural design, urbanism, and conservation, sort of conservation and sustainability, uh, and have tried to kind of touch on those. Um, we are also, every year, we try to involve at least one alumnus as a lecturer. So our first, actually we had two this year, uh, Jen Luce, who was our first lecturer, and Joe Lobko. Uh, who was involved. Uh, Sol Camacho came up from Brazil and did an amazing lecture on, on conservation of uh, modernist area stuff in Sao Paulo. Um, we dealt with urbanism in, the, uh, in Dave Wex and Michael Sorensen and Joe Lobko's lecture, and to some degree talked about it with uh, the indigenous lecture. Uh, Mark Markle talked about the challenges of housing uh, Canada's in, uh, urban indigenous population, which is significant. Uh, and yes, over the course of this year, we've had a, a bit of a sub-theme to deal with uh, indigenous issues, uh, which are extremely timely, um, have been timely for a long time, but have finally getting some attention. Um, and I'm extremely pleased that we're able to end this, this uh, series this year with our lecturer tonight, who's Alfred Waugh. Uh, Alfred, uh, as, yeah, I, I must say the one thing we do every year is we make sure we at least have one Governor General Medals Award. So you're our token Governor General Medals Award winner, but... Uh, uh, we're really pleased Alfred has, uh, it turns out, was just here two weeks ago to receive the award and very graciously agreed, this was probably months ago, to come back a second time, which has arrived at three in the morning last night and uh, leaves at seven in the morning tomorrow. So whether he'll remember this lecture, I don't know, but we certainly will, and we're very grateful that he's here. So, so Alfred's, uh, the title of his lecture is Indigene Indigenuity, um, and uh, the short description is that Alfred is a Vancouver-based architect uh, and tonight, among other things, he'll show us the work of Formline Architecture, his firm, including uh, the project that just won the Governor General's Medal, uh, namely uh, the Indi Indi Indian, in Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center on the UBC campus. So Alfred is the founder of Formline Architecture, and he specializes in culturally and environmentally sensitive projects and has extensive experience with First Nations with cultural societies and with educational institutions. And his firm is dedicated to developing solutions that reflect the culture, community, and geographic regions specific to each of the projects. The designs are a direct response to site context, to topography, to climate, uh, and regional materials. And as part of a sustainable design philosophy, Alfred aims to maximize comfort, longevity, uh, functionality, uh, and energy efficiency. Um, Alfred is indeed a status Indian, a part of Treaty 8. He was born and raised in Yellowknife uh, in the Northwest Territories and was the first Aboriginal person to graduate with honors from UBC School of Architecture um, way back in 1993 um, and became a lead certified and registered architect. Prior to his architectural degree, Alfred acquired a Bachelor of Arts majoring in Urban and Regional Analysis at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, He's influenced by native culture, by the northern climate and frontier architecture, uh, and his connection to and respect for nature is very much inherent in his work. Uh, I guess Alfred let me know he also was a partner and worked for a number of years with, uh, with uh, Peter Busby uh, as well. So there's an interesting connection there to go. So um, it is absolutely my pleasure to welcome Alfred to the podium. So I ask you to join me in uh, giving him a round of applause. Change over to the slide show. Well, it's a pleasure to be here um, this evening for a second time in a couple months. I like Ottawa. It kind of reminds me of, in a funny way of my hometown in Yellowknife being a, a territorial capital. Um, Tonight, oh yeah, and I'd like to also um, acknowledge um, that we're on the unceded territory of the Algonquin or Anishinaabe. Um, I did do some work here with the National Capital Commission, so 
looking at Victoria Island here, so I got to know a little bit of the history of Ottawa um, and uh, our Indigenous past here. Um, this lecture, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about our approach um, to Indigenous architecture. Let's see if this thing works here. There we go. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing because I, I do work predominantly with First Nations uh, clients and uh, many of the elders, um, they often will say to me, it, it is important to understand who you are, not uh, how many initials you have behind your, your name. And um, just to give you a little bit of background, I, I was born and raised in, in Yellowknife. My mother um, was from our, uh, from her treaty band is in Fond du Lac and uh, northern Saskatchewan. And um, my father is a British prospector. He's staked probably over 40 million square miles in the Arctic. He's been in many places most people haven't been. So I spent much of my youth out on the land. Um, the bottom right-hand picture is a picture of my mother and her sister with some baby great horned owls. We spend a lot of time out on the Great Slave Lake fishing. And um, I grew up around head frames, which were always something that were um, interesting to me. They, they were like Douglas fir um, wood structures, and uh, it, it's funny how these things have uh, um, embedded in your, in your history. And one of the things um, I've wrestled with in, in my family and so forth is, is you know, reconciliation. But I, I think, you know, in, in some sense, I like to look at Turtle Island or, you know, North America or the world in the sense that I think there has to be a way to bring together Indigenous ways of knowing and, and Western knowledge. If everybody goes far enough back in their past, they were connected to the land in some way, in shape or form. Um, in, in the sense that, you know, in, in nature, everything is interconnected. With indigenous culture, nature is at the center of our value system rather than humankind. And that's a big difference between, you know, the, in the Western world, and, and we've become so advanced, and AI is on the top of our mind, but that advancement came from the ability to isolate things in nature and understand the mechanics of how nature works so that we can manipulate it. However, along that journey, we've kind of lost that kind of interconnectedness of, of how we are part of the earth and everything we do um, affects the earth, especially when we're at a scale now of approaching 8 billion people. If we're not already there, um, we do have an impact on this, this earth. And even though Elon wants to put us on Mars, um, he's also doing his part trying to get everybody to drive an electric car, but we all have to do our part. And as a small firm, and working with many different types of clients and different levels of sophistication, we, we, we look at architecture simply in, in the form of uh, the four directions in the sense that um, there are many elements that go into uh, making architecture. And, you know, one of the elements, of course, that we focus uh, largely on is, is, is cultural identity and how to how to express cultural identity in the built form in the building, especially uh, when you have lost that connection to the past. Um, also, community or context, how does your, your building or your built environment plug into the natural environment or as well as the urban in, environment? And, and, envir and, and the environment factor is, if we are the custodians and we do claim that we're the closest to nature, then how do we express that, how do our buildings touch the earth lightly, use less energy, use materials with low embodied energy and so forth. And then technology, what is the technology we use? And often from a critical regional point of view, I look at what's available in the area, as well as also creating an opportunity often for indigenous communities to participate in the act of construction. And then also just the fascination of how things go together. And so I'm going to talk about merging cultural precedents with sustainable strategies, um, innovation in the use of wood, um, integration of building and site, and developing cultural identity through tectonics. So this lecture is a bit of a, just a journey. Uh, one of the, the, the first projects that I stepped out on my own with after leaving Peter Busby was the 
Squamish Little Cultural Center. And this, this was located in the resort municipality of Whistler. And it was a coming together of two nations, the Squamish Nation, which were coastal, and the Lillooet, or Mount Curry Nation, which were interior, coast, interior Salish, which they had the, uh, their, their, type, their typology was the winter home. And instead of competing against each other on the Callahan Valley, which it runs from Vancouver up to Whistler, uh, economically, they signed a protocol agreement to work together. And, and it happened that resort municipality of Whistler had a piece of land up uh, near Blackholm and Larmer Way uh, that was designated cultural loot, uh, use. So this was a partnership on many different levels. Uh, it was complex because there's funding from the federal government, provincial government, you had the resort municipality of Whistler giving up this land for a dollar for 30 year lease. Then you had two nations coming together. So often in our meetings, we had over 20, 25 people with all the lawyers and Deloitte and Touche and everybody uh, to develop the project. And it was hard to navigate that as a young architect and how to bring these two nations together. And, and one of the, the things that we, we looked at is how do we maintain that kind of connection to the land? Instead of being a, a, a black box, we wanted this building to be a beacon to the world and about coming and sharing um, indigenous culture. So the building is very much about reaching out into the land. And it was a, it was a difficult building in the sense that it was a very hilly site. I don't have the laser pointer working, um, but it's the slight curve is follows the topography so we can reduce cut and fill. And then, uh, so it's a fairly simple plan. Um, it, we enter on the east axis through the building, and we have this great hall um, that is used for displaying uh, monumental artwork. It has a little theater. It has number five, which is the, the sort of more of an area where we have artifacts that are sensitive to natural light. And with many of these cultural buildings, you actually have number six, which is a place for the elders to come whenever they want, so they can kind of participate in that, in, in, in the cultural center. And they also had a youth ambassador program here. So when you go to the, um, oh, am I walking away from here? No, I'm gonna give you a pointer with a laser pointer. Okay, so when you, when you walk away, when, when you enter the building, you're greeted by often uh, youth ambassadors who do a drum dance and introduce you to the building. And, oops, I'm going that's wrong. Me. Okay. That's, that's the advance back and forth and that's the laser. Okay, okay, thanks. So on the, on the lower level is, you know, you have your archival place, you have your um, place where you take artifacts in and fumigate and, and um, prepare ex exhibitry, you have your administration, small gift shop, and then the, the circular place is, is a, an Ishkin inspired structure, but this is a non-pay zone, so the community can actually rent this space and use it for many different functions, whether it's, yeah, yoga classes or farmers markets and or weddings and so forth. There was a lot of effort put into the business plan to make this economically viable as you know that cultural centers are typically not economically sustainable. Um, so Deloitte and Touche did a business plan. Up at the top level on this uh, project we have the temporary exhibit and then the idea of the building is, is this journey through the building to arrive at the top of the hill and then you enter the forest and you have a couple of pavilions out the back, one for, for displaying carving and one is reflected of, of the actual traditional Ishkin structure so you get a sense of the scale and size and then you walk along a trail in the forest and there's um, external exhibitry telling you about the plants. Even though it was a 31,000 square foot building and we had sensitive artifacts in there, we the, the the large great hall was for monumental art for house posts and so forth. We were able to uh, integrate natural ventilation into the building. It is a LEED certified building. And um, it is a merging of two cultures. So um, one of the things that we had to do is figure out how to represent each culture. So the, the Lillooet people with their Ishkin are sitting out in the front and they have, we've used locally basalt uh, rock as sort of the plinth, so they're kind of the foundation. They hold the, 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 the delicate longhouse above it. 
And so we looked at inspiration from the Coast Salish House for the, the longhouse, and uh, it, was, it was an interesting um, exercise because most buildings, they shed snow and they have a drop zone around the building. So we, we decided to actually hold the snow on this building and, and be respectful to the traditional uh, longhouses, which had a slight slope to it. And then we had these double glue lamb columns um, when we wanted to hide rainwater leaders and electrical and all the things that architects want to do. But in order to do that, there was no sort of code um, um, guidelines, so they had to do buckling analysis on these uh, columns. And the, and the spacing of the columns are, you know, structurally similar to the, the proportion of the longhouse. It's 12 to um, 10 to 12 um, feet on center. And then because we, we wanted to turn this, uh, the, a cultural center inside out and saying that it's a beacon, and we want people to drive by it at night and be enticed to go inside it. Um, we looked at how to, <clears throat> um, it, this, the, the main part of the facade is facing north. And uh, so you get that diffused light, that controlled light. And we looked to the Salish Longhouse. They had the uh, post and beam structure and then almost a primitive curtain wall system with these smaller poles that hold these cedar boards that were about two feet deep. And they would take those off in the summertime, actually, and drag them behind the canoes and make summer camps. So I, I, I got on this kind of idea of making a transparent plank house. So we had to make a double glazed um, system, and we had to invent it. And we worked with advanced glazing and came up with this system and used a clevis stainless steel tie system supported back to the, the glue lamb columns. And where we pulled away from those glue and columns, <clears throat> we still needed to take the wind loads. So we used these bow trusses, which have an obvious reference. And then one of the big parts of this building is, again, to be economically sustainable. And so what we decided to do with the main exhibit hall is um, we, we leaned towards the, you know, the theater um, sort of technology and used a pulley system so you can lift up all the exhibitry off the floor and then you can rent out as a venue. Um, so making it uh, something that can complement all the conferences that have in, happen in Whistler. And then that Ishkin structure downstairs, again, it becomes sort of a part of the community. So it's, it's not only a focus on indigenous culture, but it's really an integral part of the community of, of Whistler. So it gets rented out for weddings and, and uh, various other activities. The next project is the First People's House, and this is in the University of Victoria. It's about a 10,000 square foot building, and like myself, I came from a remote community in Yellowknife. There's no universities up north. Um, and it's, it's intimidating to go down south and go to university, and often Indigenous students don't complete their secondary, post-secondary education. So you see more of these buildings happening all over the country. And it's kind of like a home away from home. Um, initially, the um, facilities management wanted to put this building here because they said, oh, well, you're indigenous, you want to be in the forest. But interesting, when we were talking to the Luongo people in the local area, um, they said, no, we want to be an integral part of the identity of this campus. And so we started looking, there was a large quadrangle here, and then there was a smaller courtyard. And there was nothing defining the break between the two, so we said, well, why don't we use this 250-foot building to provide an edge to this uh, quadrangle and create a more intimate courtyard here. And then playing with that, we, of course, on the, the entrance is on the eastern uh, axis again, uh, which is always uh, something that comes up in indigenous architecture as, you know, the beginning of the day um, represents education, learning, and many other different things, depending on which nation you're talking to. We, uh, like the cultural center in Whistler, we wanted this building to be inviting so it's not feeling exclusive, so we wanted students to wander into this building. So the, the building, the, the main ceremonial hall and the classrooms are on axis, the east-west axis, but the actual campus is about slightly six degrees off, and this created an opportunity to, to have the administration block slightly off uh, angle and created an interesting corridor. And then UVic had 1,400 pieces of uh, native art and storage. So I said, why don't we use this corridor to kind of rotate and display it? 
And then on the, the other uh, element too is this was all lawn and, and Gary Oak trees. And so we worked with uh, Vaughn, um, Don Vaughn, a landscape architect to return all the, the planting to indigenous plant materials that we um, decided or selected in consultation with our, our steering committee. As a reference to the um, <clears throat> interior Salish, the earth house people, we have two rammed earth walls on each side and a planted roof. And it's a LEED Gold certified building. And so what we did here is, is we wanted to, to because uh, we're in a rainy and a rainforest climate, we often express water. And in this building was the first sort of uh, attempt at expressing water. We created a waterfall feature. And we have a pond here with an aeration pump in it. And then in the winter time when it gets really wet, that pond overflows into a seasonal wetland. And then uh, on the top of the roof, we have a low albedo uh, sarnifold roof, um, and then a planted roof. We also, for fun, sourced uh, spun uh, aluminum rain chains um, along the buildings just to kind of add some dynamism on the rains uh, and express water. And this uh, becomes a little counseling um, deck here. So even though you're in a busy campus, you create these little moments. And it is lead gold, so what we started doing is looking at the traditional Salish longhouse, and they used to lift the boards up about six inches around the edge to ensure a draft so that the smoke would go up through the smoke hole. So I said, well, why don't we use displacement ventilation for this whole building? And in order to do that, we had to do computer fluid dynamic modeling, um, because I wanted to use the minimum amount of mechanical fresh air, I mean, mechanical air, we, and I think that was 15 CFM per person. Our mechanical engineer at the time says, we're not doing that. This is, we've been doing buildings for 20 years, we're not gonna do that. So I convinced the university to buy the CFD program so they had to use it. So we ended up modeling every room to the actual occupant load and created this offset louver system to exhaust the air. And then we had an earth tube from the outside. So this is a ventilation totem. The air goes down below the, the ground and up to the mechanical room. So 100% fresh air. And then because we're in a temperate climate, we could get ventilation just about 12 months of the year, even when it's four or five degrees uh, outside, in order to address thermal comfort in the room, if you have a window open, we created a, another system, uh, was a mechanical damper system, so that we could still use a DDC system to provide natural ventilation and that goes over a hydronic coil and preheats it before it goes into the room. And the architecture gets reflected by this concept. So the larger the room is, the more offset louvers you have. There's an acoustic baffle in the middle. And then smaller rooms have smaller um, door transoms. We sourced, um, again, sort of a reference to the plank house. We sourced 2 by 10 clear vertical grain red cedar, which would cost a fortune nowadays. And we sourced that from the Dididat Nation and I helped source that a year in advance of construction. And the, here is a little a bit of a different sort of expression of the post and beam. These, these post and beam Salish longhouses used to saddle a large beam into a, actually a rectangular column. So we did that, but working with Equilibrium, our structural engineer, we have each um, column and, and beam calibrated to the loads in the span. So we use the least amount of uh, material we can to, to express the structure and we use tight fit stainless steel dowels um, to hold it together. Um, the other thing was the ceremonial room. We needed an acoustic treatment in that room so we started looking to the old um, Salish longhouses and they used to use Thule mats to keep the draft out. This is a couch in Longhouse, and they just use these blinds, but traditionally it was a woven tule mat, so we came up with a woven cedar um, panel. So we have this woven cedar panel around the room backed by insulation. You can even see in this room here, you have the slots for natural ventilation. We have that in reference to the smoke hole up top, and we have a low velocity fan up here. I had to source this fireplace, because we wanted a fireplace, and fire is important, but we didn't want to obstruct the view because this has to be a multifunctional room. So we sourced a fireplace from France. It's a residential fireplace where the supply and the exhaust air are all below the floor. So if you go back to this slide here, that's the fan that sucks it all up the building. And it took 
quite an effort to get it approved in Canada <laughs> and, and a cost. Um, but again, similar to the cultural center, this is a, a, a multifunctional space. It's used for many different functions and it becomes part of the community. Now here's the, the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. Now this is the one that uh, I was here a couple weeks for, <coughs> go for. It's, it's a modest sized building. This building here is, uh, is the main building, but part of it takes, it occupies an existing part of the Sedwick Library. This is the Sedwick Library. It's about 6,700 square feet. And the story of this is um, the Irving Barber building was built in 1912. And even to get this building located here is a bit of a coup. This is the center of knowledge of UBC, a very large campus. I think it's approaching 40,000 people. But to get it located here to preserve that unfortunate past in Canada, I think was attributed to the efforts of the uh, Link Kessler, the previous director of the House of Learning. But anyway, we have the Irving Barber Library, and then we had the Sedwick Library, which was designed by Henricas in the 70s. It was a buried library, and it had this nice uh, landscape bowl, and they had the main entrance where our building is coming in. However, uh, Erickson designed the corner library and then they changed the main entrance to the corner library. There's no need for this main entrance and then this area became a dead area on campus. So we used this building and we worked with PFS Studio, the landscape architect, to revitalize this area and create a special place. Um, there was some challenges. This is a Rodney Graham. I think he just recently passed away. He had a camera oculus installation here pointing at a cypress tree behind our building. So we couldn't make the building sort of ostentatious and loud um, because that camera oculus records the nature as it changes and we, we consulted him and he thought it was great that we're doing this building. So we got his blessing. The building has a simple program and, and the difficult thing about this is we wanted to put the exhibit tree and we called it the, the, the Vault of Memories. Uh, down at, in the existing part of the building, but you got to get people almost 30 feet down. So we wanted to revitalize that landscape bowl, so we decided we'll just run that landscape bowl into the building. So it becomes an external stair and an interior stair, and then we have a, a small elevator for accessibility within the building. And basically the upstairs is, is about looking to the future, um, uh, more enlightened and light structure, whereas the Vault of Memories is, holds the memories of, of uh, residential school. The other aspect too is many buildings look down upon this building here, so we again wanted to make a feature of the roof, and that, that becomes an uh, uh, interesting point while I'll talk about. So the, the program of the building is very simple. Again, another eastern entrance. You can see the exterior stair, the interior stair. We have some admin uh, functions. Um, but we also, there's not really a front and back, so we have this West Park Plaza here, so in, a, in order to, to avoid a back of the building, we, we located this small staff kitchen here and had double, you know, big sliding doors so they could cater learning events outside here and create a, a bleacher area for outdoor events. Um, they wanted us to make the meeting rooms special, so we hung them over this existing wall, so they're kind of cantilevered pointing into the landscape. At the bottom level here, um, we have the existing, this is the existing library, an existing storage room that we kind of um, occupied and turned into exhibitory space. It's a fairly simple exhibitory space. It has interactive uh, panels on the wall that you can kind of touch on any residential school and pull up information, and that's a conduit to, to uh, Winnipeg's, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and it evolves as we get more information. But I, I, thought, I saw this as, as an opportunity to, if, if often there's ceremonies to have these big sliding doors and spill out onto the plaza. Again, we wanted to kind of uh, celebrate water and the importance to the Coast Salish people and we created a, a stormwater retention pond that brings all the water off the roof. <clears throat> and this was not intended, but every year the Truth and Reconciliation March happens here. They use this as a stage and they have a, all the speeches and dances here and then they walk down campus to the reconciliation pool. That waterfall, we have a glass waterfall here. Again, it's a butterfly roof. And uh, the story of the roof is campus wanted us to put a green roof on it 
and then one of the elders said, well, we had to respect this cypress tree with the Rodney Graham art. It sits low and it's kind of like burying history. And I said, well, the coastal people up north used to use copper as a copper shield to represent clans. So why don't you let this group have a copper roof? Um, and, you know, you put copper on your parliament buildings, it gives them some dignity. So we won that argument. <clears throat> so you can kind of see the section here. We brought that, that cedar wall that we developed in the first people's house into this building. And that leads to kind of this building <clears throat> um, challenge because Link asked us to design a indigenous building, but it could not represent any one nation in the country. Um, but somehow still has to respect um, indigenous people. When we were talking to the survivors of the Musqueam, uh, people that went to the Musqueam Residential School, uh, one of the things we asked them, and I didn't point it out before, but they said, we, I asked them, and I said, what is the most important thing about this building if you're in this building? And they said, well, we may be looking at stuff on the wall, and we may have an emotional response to it. I want to have the ability anywhere in this building to look outside and have a connection to the landscape. So that's why the building's so transparent. The other aspect too is, 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 is looking at materials and what they represent. For me, this was developed based on the bulrush mats that were used to keep the draft out of Longhouse, but most people relate to basket weaving. Um, the cedar is often said to be the blood of the Salish people, they use it in so many different ways in their culture. By charring it um, symbolizes the resilience and what they've gone through. And of course the chief's copper um, is what's on the roof. And then looking towards the future we use cross laminated timber for the, the ceiling structure and the shear walls in the building as, as a kind of a, a representation of a people that are still evolving. Fairly simple building as a we got a 91 millimeter cross laminated timber um, ceiling plane with cantilevers, charged cedar um, curtain wall system that's grafted to glue lamp columns. What we did here, we had one of the people from the de design panel says, you're never gonna pull off this roof without big beams. And so I kind of took that on a challenge. This is actually a flat plate piece of steel and there's rivets going through the CLT panel and then there's a W section on top of it. So it's actually suspending that panel so we can avoid the, the beams. And then here's that waterfall. Um, now the waterfall feature, I guess it's more of a, um, to me a symbolic reference to the tears of all the people that went through residential school. So when you're in the meeting room here and it rains a lot, you have this cascade of water and then, you know, I guess I was inspired by my time in Spain. I did a studies abroad and all the Moorish architecture and the way they deal with water. So we have this water coming out to this trench here. There's just a few pictures of it. This is all inhabited now um, with, with more exhibitry. And these are the screens, the interactive screens. A fairly simple building. Um, I, I don't particularly like the cabin-like feel of CLT panels, and I wanted the, the, the building to be light, so we whitewashed all the CLT panels to make it kind of light and airy. And this is closer out here. This is in Scarborough campus. This is the indigenous house. Again, about similar size um, to the first people's house, about 10,000 square feet. Not too dissimilar program. It has a large gathering space. It, and some offices and meeting rooms in, in the, the building. And, the, and uh, when we started this project, um, there was a program. It was a, there was already a, a program developed and it actually told you wherever all the program elements went. And there was a large um, gathering place that they wanted to look over this river ravine here. And I said, well, it doesn't really make sense to have a large gathering place on the second floor of a building. So Andrew and I were having our disagreements, and then I found the fact that there was a cross slope in the site, and I said, well, we'll just bring a ramp right up there so everybody can kind of share that vista of the, the gathering place. So we embedded the building into the site, and there's this ramp that comes up around the building. Um, and then everybody can kind of, whether the building's closed or not, you can kind of enjoy that experience, and the building kind of emerges out of the landscape. 
We worked with um, public work out of um, Toronto, great landscape architects to develop uh, a palette of materials indigenous to the area. There's, there's a birch forest around here and, and we worked with the elders on, on these foraging gardens and so forth around the building. There's a learning um, garden as well here taking advantage of the slope. Here you can kind of see that ramp that comes up around the building. Um, large gathering place, again, this the wigwam people in this area. Um, sometimes they're, they're sort of just a circular structure, sometimes they're kind of longhouses. So we had these two structures connected um, together by this structure here. This is that learning area in, in the back. And this is the ramp up to the, the top of the building. Um, again, our inspiration was from the, the wigwam type structure. And here's a view of the larger wigwam. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I, I found was is I found this interesting little diagram in uh, Nabokov's book. And uh, it was actually a birch bark um, cylinder that pr provided oxygen to the fire. So this kind of echoed sort of the idea of an earth tube. So we used that system again, similar to the first people's house, but it was more extensive because you need more resistance, um, especially in a colder climate to get the benefits of the geothermal conditionings of the, the air. So we have this mechanical room in the basement. And this is uh, another project that I'm curr we're currently working on. We're just finishing 90% drawings. And this is in Saskatoon. And it's, um, their new, it's not a native project, but um, I think we're the prime consultants with a team of us. Formline architecture, Chevrolet Morales, who Stefan Chevrolet happens to be a close friend of mine. And he specializes in libraries, does fantastic libraries in Architecture 49 because we figured we needed a big production firm. Um, and I think we were hired because they wanted a building that would kind of break down the ties. S Saskatoon has one of the highest populations per capita of Métis and Indigenous people, and there's a lot of racism there. And so we wanted to create a building that was inclusive and felt like um, a living room for the community, so everybody felt welcoming to it. Again, looking at some of the, the obvious precedents in the prairie, looking at the teepee structure, um, it's, it's an interesting structure in the sense that they, they had all these kinds of ways of directing wind and so forth. And then at the advent of, 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 of I'll just, for what Apple wants to update right now. But um, with, with, with uh, tra uh, traders or trappers and so forth, the canvas came in, so the buffalo skins went away. And, but the, the, the nice thing you get with a canvas is you get that nice filtering of light through it. So I wanted to capture that. And some of the essence of this, and how do you do that with a 150,000 square foot building over four stories? So we started looking at uh, a triple glazed um, shingled system so that in between each shingle, we would have uh, actually natural ventilation that comes into the, the raised floor system here. Uh, we used uh, limestone on the um, around the perimeter in the back of the building. And where we have interconnected space near the, the envelope, we peel away that, um, that shingling system. Um, the other aspect too, we wanted to respect the Métis people and besides the, the, the red carts, the, the log cabin was uh, an important symbol to their culture. So we ended up using mass timber um, for this building. And the other thing too is, is, is another interesting thing about Saskatoon, it has some of the least amount of green spaces out of any can, uh, city in Canada. So we wanted to make a compact footprint on the, it's almost, it's a city block, half a city block long, and create a public plaza in the, in the south facing and a plaza in the north. So you, you have this sort of an ovoid shaped building with a cafe out to the street, main entrance to a southern plaza that can be programmed for many different activities. And this busy route that tr tr takes you to the university is more of a ornamental garden in, uh, in the back of the building. You enter the building, you have a, a large theater, you have your um, quick circulation um, supply of uh, books here, a reception, 
programming, communal kitchen. These, and as you know, libraries are evolving. There's many different things that happen into them. They're used quite a bit by the community. And on the second level, we have our children's area, children's theater, maker space, teenage area in the, in the back, and, and a consistent staffing um, and on the alley side. To your main stacks, your, your, um, your reading room in the back that faces north. And then instead of having one central atrium through the building, we decided to have a series of atriums that kind of step up through the building and create these little moments um, in the building so there's interest at more on an intimate scale throughout the building. And on the fourth floor, we have a storytelling room um, for more or less representing Indigenous culture, local history, and a, a grand a circular stair that connects the two main uh, um, stacks, which is the third and fourth floor. Again, bringing that idea of, of a, thermal, um, a thermal chimney using atrium to, to ventilate the building. Um, these are just some elevations of the building. And then this is the hybrid system. Um, it's, we have the glue lamp columns, and we have a glue lamp slab band that's combined with concrete. The concrete topping on, on CLT is usually just used for acoustics and, and uh, to supplement the fire rating. We're using a raised floor system um, to uh, provide uh, a, a ease of access to electrical and mechanical. And then here's the, some images of the building. This is the children's theater. This is the reading room. It's very hard to do CLT and make a curved building out of it. <laughs> It's, it's, not, it's not easy, I don't know if I, well, now that we've done it once, maybe we'll do it again, but it takes a lot of effort from our structural engineers. So that circular stair. This is that reading room, again, using that same woven cedar panel. And this one's in Nova Scotia. This is a Mi'kmaq de Burt. Um, and uh, they are a very sophisticated group of people. They really know their history and this, this project is in a forest. However, in the forest, there's many archeological sites and you have to have a 50 meter radius from that site. So even though it looks like it's easy to locate this building, it was very difficult to locate it, navigating all the archeological sites. The idea of this project is you actually park your car and you leave this world and you enter the Mi'kmaq de Burt world. So you, you actually enter this, uh, entrance and it's built into the side of the hill and as you go into the building the other side of the hill opens out to the forest. It is a net zero building um, and so we have um, passive house, um, we have solar panels on the top of it, um, green roof and a programmable space on top of the building. It's a little closer look at the programming on the top of the building. And the, the entrance we went through many different variations because it is the, the first thing you see when you enter this hillside and uh, what resonated the most at first we had these big rammed earth walls that are red because the soil is very red around there so we wanted to use that as an expression of entering uh, as a cut in the archaeological dig however our client thought that was too much like the desert and had nothing to do with them so we started looking at um, eel traps they used to make these V-shaped eel traps, and then they had these fish baskets. So we said, well, why don't we kind of look at this kind of funneling of people into the hillside and then take a cross-section of that uh, eel trap. And uh, so we came up with something like this that we're working on. And this is the inside. So these are simple 2 by 12s and glue lamb beams. Um, the eight-pointed star was important to them, and motifs are really important. They want to have petroglyphs everywhere on this building. We're trying to temper that with a little bit of meaning. But we, we start looking at the double curve, and that double curve comes up into this expression. They, they wanted a large gathering place. Again, the cultural centers for Indigenous communities are often community buildings, so chief and council meetings would happen here. Uh, we're working with Aldrich Pears, our exhibit designer, so there's four galleries. And then there's a residential component in this gallery, so then there's a reflection room for a quiet area that pokes over uh, into the trees. 
uh, admin in the back and the keeping house um, for artifacts in the back here. A room that families can actually get um, artifacts out and look at them. A little cafe, um, they have a school program, so they have a demonstration teaching area, an outdoor teaching area as well. And this where we have mainly a concrete structure and then we have a wood structure in front of it, more of a light wood structure. And then this is that gathering space we're working through right now. And then this is the other side of the building as it opens out to the forest. I think that's about it. And there's maybe just one thing uh, we whipped up in this year. I whipped this up in a couple weeks here, working with uh, engagement with the Okanagan tribe. And uh, this is a fun project. It's only 4,000 square feet. And uh, again, we were looking at how do you build something iconic, small, and also integrate public washrooms into it because it's, it's a, a long, a decommissioned CPR rail trail and they get 250,000 people walking along this trail to Woodland Lake. So um, we had to integrate washrooms and, and make some sort of impact. So we were looking at, again, the Thule Mat teepee. Here, here you can actually see what it, what it looks like if you, if you haven't seen one before and the, the earth house. And so we were looking at, uh, and then they had this swamp here, so we can actually, uh, working with the landscape architect bench, which are a good group of people, actually look at having tule reeds here and harvesting and have this kind of outdoor learning um, process, and then create this sort of semi-private space here outside for ceremonies and outdoor learning, and then still have a public focus here. So it's a very simple program. You know, you come in, you have an entrance reception area, it's sort of an exhibitory meeting room, but this is mainly going to be used by a community. A uh, little kitchen storage area, uh, the roof plan. Uh, so these are some of the sections. But the idea is we, we were, we're going to use quarter round logs, you know, those cheap log materials you, you, you put on log cabins and use that to make these a shingled siding. So I, I don't think I've seen this done before. So I think uh, that this is what kind of excites me is to figure out doing something like this. Using a ready-made material because the budget isn't there. Using tilt up concrete panels because we can't afford rammed earth and still try to achieve something that's powerful. And here's that sort of semi-private area here where we bleed the logs into the earth and have these concrete capstones and run that, that pond right into the building. And then this is the interior. So you have this kind of descending, the beams are getting wider as it's getting longer, but it focuses your attention on that space outside here. And because of the light so intense, the you know, Okanagan is to bring that sliver of light along the edge. And then we're working with our exhibit designer Panther, and they're, they're, they have some great ideas about what we're doing. So this is just a, in the inception stage, but uh, kind of gives you a quick view of the process. But I think that that's that's about it. If anybody wants some questions. <laughs> Before we get into questions, yeah, I just want to uh, take a moment to thank you, Alfred. Uh, Really interesting presentation. I was struck with uh, what appears to be this kind of, as you're moving west to east from the longhouse to much more organic forms, the, the, the challenge of, of working changes. And you're really having to, th to think through materials uh, quite differently in order to get these much more organic forms. So it's, it's an interesting evolution. I th thought the project at the end, this last one, is, is a really great amalgam between the kind of more rectilinear longhouse ones that you shown earlier and some of the more organic ones. It's just absolutely stunning. So thank you very much for showing that as well. So we have um, we have the opportunity to uh, to ask a few questions, uh, and we have a mic that I can uh, pass around. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and I'll come up, and we'll let uh, Alfred come back to the.
your buildings seem to so beautifully represent a number of different indigenous forms, and I wondered what technique you used to um, learn so much about each different group and how best to represent them. Um, well, <clears throat> I, I find uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm actually quite an introvert, so I'm, I'm better at listening than talking. So through the engagement sessions, the biggest challenge I find is, is getting knowledge keepers to share their knowledge and stories. So we'll often do um, group um, working sessions, but I'll often go back to the community and just sit down with individuals and talk to them. And uh, sometimes you, you get knowledge that you wouldn't normally get. And so for me, it's, it's trying to find something that resonates with the community or people and uh, something that ultimately the building has to stand while you're gone and they have to be proud of it and take care of it, right? And, and I, I, think, I think for me, it's, it's, just, it's just listening and, and, and maybe just having an inventive mind in a sense. Like I grew up with a father who was a prospector, but he also um, grew up with my mother's father who had to do everything from blacksmith to carpentry to, to whatever. So you're always trying to think of how to express these things and the element of craftsmanship and how things go together fascinate me. So it's, it's not just programmatic for me, it's programmatic as well as tectonic. Um, I guess that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> That, that was really so amazing. And um, what you were just saying about the tectonic and the tech, and really the technical and the, all of the, um, let's say the almost indigenous inspired mechanics of mo modern scientific buildings. Uh, and I appreciate that you showed the drawings of those um, mechanisms that you were uh, reproducing in. Um, you know, in, in contemporary languages, and 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 uh, so from that point of view, it really feels like a an amazing and beautiful kind of full circle where indigenous architecture is, be, is the is the is pointing the way. And and so I, I wondered whether you get um, like it just feels like um, there's a lot of of of, of vital contemporary knowledge that is um it's really coming that you're you're recuperating it or or revealing it from indigenous structures and finding ways to activate and and i wonder if you if you get a lot of questions from western practices or or southern practices to no, yeah not not necessarily it's again like my I guess my on a on a broader vision is, is is like part of that global reconciliation is how do we bring the two worlds together, right? How do you bring this high tech evolving world that we live in, and then create buildings that kind of make people a little bit more aware of where they are and how they're connected to their surroundings, and and so I I think. It's a good medium to work in, you know, working for indigenous people and then doing a project like the library, which is not an indigenous project, kind of bringing that to the community um, is, you know, is, is where I want to go. I don't, I don't want to be pigeonholed just as an indigenous architect. I want to be able to, to, to do to evolve our work where we're, we're trying to bring some of the values we have to the greater community. That's sort of our goal. I, I have a, another observation. Uh, this is just a little nostalgic for me, but <clears throat> when we, those of us who went through school in the 80s were very much into architectural theory and we learned about <clears throat> Gottfried Semper and his whole idea of the evolution of architecture. And, learned uh, about how uh, the, that kind of classical Greek vocabulary with the columns and the stone all derived from wood originally. So uh, the, the Zemper idea is that it all started with a kind of dais 
and some wood frame and hung with tapestries. So you start with a very ephemeral architecture and then it just gets reinterpreted and reinterpreted and reinterpreted over time until it, it kind of calcifies into this stone stuff which has then had its own trajectory. And I'm seeing that a little bit in your work too. You're kind of going back to the, the basic kind of structural frame, wooden frame, things hung on the frame, but sort of trying to bring it forward uh, at the same time uh, as it evolves in the context culturally, technologically, and uh, temporally changes. So I think it's really, really interesting to see this. And it reminded me very much of Zemper and the notion of the, the tapestry hanging on the wood frame as the, the origin of the Greek temple. Yeah, well, if they didn't cut all their forests down in the Mediterranean, they'd probably still be building logs in the Roman times, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's funny that we, we tend to forget that most of the things that we see out of stone and vocabulary, like the classical vocabulary that we think entirely of stone, derived out of very natural materials over a yeah. long period of time and became yeah. its own vocabulary. So, we're, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of seeing this incipient new vocabulary emerging out yeah. of... Yeah, and like anything, I'm concerned. Like, I, I actually get asked to speak with forestry companies and, and, and conferences, but, you know, like, if everybody starts using wood, it's like if everybody has an electric car, you know, like, it's a finite resource. So we have to kind of start rethinking our whole forestry industry. The clear cutting and, and, and planting may not be the solution if you're going to provide that much fiber on mass, right? The Europeans, um, you know, they, they have more of a scientific approach, maybe not the best, but um, they, they control their fiber, they, can, they have controlled farming of it. So I'm, I'm not sure what the solution is. But there's got to be a better solution than the damage we're doing to our e ecosystem with, you know, going into natural habitats and, and clearing wood out. Yeah. You know, like we have a lot of potential farmland. We have a lot of potential space in this country. Maybe there's a better way and an efficient way because you can actually grow fiber without too many branches and, and so forth and, and not waste so much good natural fiber that serves as the habitat for many animals. Uh, yeah, um, no, thank you for the lecture. I wish there were maybe more students here, um, but uh, because I find there are like, you know, phenomenal lessons in architecture, just the programming, the planning, everything is really well thought through. Um, and you make it look easy <laughs> in a way, like, um, but at the same time, I can't, um, I couldn't. I uh, stopped myself from thinking about like all these conversations, like how do you manage that? You know, how do you manage to convince whoever, like the contractor, the client, in terms of the, you know, innovative use of materials um, and or just, you know, certain things that haven't be necessarily been done in that same way. So I, I, I guess the question maybe is, um, I mean, on the one hand, I was like, you know, what, what are some of the hardest things to kind of sell? But maybe another way is to... to what you haven't really spoken to is the timeline. Like, I'm just wondering when you say, like, I listen a lot. Or, you know, I just make sure that, uh, um, you know, I go back to the community. Did you find that the, the way of working also implies maybe a, a longer time frame in terms of how the projects come to be? Or can you speak a little bit more to these, you know, um, the, the kind of, like, unspoken here that result in these yeah. projects? But, yeah. Um, well... Each pro like the, the cultural center took a long time because it, you know, some projects have funding start and stop, right? You do preliminary design and it sits on the shelf. But then there are projects like the First People's House that it's it's got a timeline. It it has to be done and and it, it's it's just more pressure. And uh, as our firm grows, I'm finding how do you manage that, right? How do you manage the quality when you when you have these tighter timelines and and that's why I'm starting to think okay well what kind of like I guess the old traditional when Frank Gehry first started is using using simple materials elegantly right so I'm I'm starting to think more that way um, and there are many examples of good architects in Canada that are that are doing it doing architecture like that like Michael Green um, but. <clears throat> I think I think that's the challenge. But the the good thing about the work I do is is everybody wants to focus on engagement, and the engagement everybody has this tight schedule, but there's always that a variable of getting everybody together for engagement. So engagement is sort of this kind of nice 
thing that happens that allows us to stretch the schedule out a little bit. You know, like I'm designing a 300,000 square foot building for NVIT, Urban Indigenous Youth, and two towers. And they wanted us to have the indicative design done in three, four months. It's very hard to do on a tight urban spot in the city. However, the engagement, just to get everybody together, is, is dragging the schedule out. It's giving us a bit more, more time to, to solidify it. Um, but it is something, I, you know, I think it's every architect is challenged with is because, you know, I, I also don't want to get to the place where my buildings are, not my buildings, but our firm's buildings are just built diagrams. Because built diagrams are kind of hollow. They don't have that soul, right? I was in a firm that built diagrams and um, sometimes there's just, there's that missing spirit to them. And that missing spirit takes a little bit more sensitivity and thought rather than sort of rationalizing what the best sort of intelligent solution is to, to, the, to resolve the program, right? So it's, you know, maybe you just try to, for me, just try to build up enough credibility so I can pick and choose. I haven't learned to say no yet, but <laughs> that's kind of the path where I'm on right now. For the first couple of examples, the it sounded like the decisions that you made were referencing very specific parts of indigenous culture. Um, so like people were looking to see very specific references of their you know past reflected in the building. And then you had one building where it wasn't meant to represent any particular nation. I was wondering in that building, um, was there a set of kind of indigenous concepts which you pulled from where, and did they feel reflected in your final product? Well, every, every project's completely different. Like I think you're talking about the Indian Residence School History and Dialogue Center. Um, you know, I was listening to the people from residential school and, and the fact that they really wanted that connection to the landscape. I wanted the building to be sort of like equal weighted to the landscape around it. Um, so that was the main premise of that building. And then the, the use of materials, because I didn't want it to look like a longhouse. I didn't want, but I wanted to have this sort of um, elegant approach of expressing a building in place. Um, it rains a lot, so I always like to, to celebrate water. I like to engage the landscape. And if that can be interpreted as indigenous, great. But it's not like a, an arsenal of things and I'm saying, oh, this is indigenous, this is not. It's, it's kind of like listening and, and finding out what's suited for that place, suited for that program, and, 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 and trying to pick up cues from the client with something that you've listened to them and you, you, you deploy in the design and they resonate with. You know, that's really what it comes down to. I don't think there's any sort of definable way of saying this is indigenous, this is not. I think it's, you know, like it's a combination of, of listening and understanding and, and sometimes it's more didactic, like the cultural center is a little bit more didactic in the sense they wanted a representation of each nation. At the beginning of that project, we wanted to merge the idea of this building built into the hillside with the longhouse. So it was like a merging of the two forms, but they would not have anything of, of that. So, you know, I'm not going to push that on them. You know, like I'm going to, in that sense, um, I, I always kind of respect what the client wants and tries to answer what they want at the best ability I have, rather than pushing an architectural idea on them. Even though, like, I kind of look at that and say, well, I wish I did it a different way, but that's not my place, it's their building. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm honestly just quite inspired by all of your landscaping um, and how well you integrate your buildings into the landscape. Uh, which leads to my question, which is, uh, how do you decide, or like, how do you de design these uh, landscaping strategies, especially while trying to tackle the challenge of working with a, like, uh, designing a building, which is already a challenge all on its own? Um, how do you decide when to remove, modify, or preserve these landscapes? And, uh, yeah, if you could please elaborate on your strategy. Well, it, it, I guess my strategy is something I struggle with my younger staff with, because uh, when I used to when I used to do a lot more drawing and uh, I used to always try to understand the topography and, and how that building could work into that topography rather than clearing it, and doing that is by studying the topography and if you redesign it, where's the new contour lines and you know like it's it's that kind of analysis that kind of gets you intimate with the land and then walking that site and seeing that there might be a certain uh, landform in the distance that's important. There might be, you know, a certain feature, some boulders. It's, it's like, it's that also being on site and doing that analysis, you know, like so often now students just dump it into the computer and just manipulate it. But the actual fact of doing it the old way and understanding it, because you're thinking, okay, this is contour 240, 250, and you're trying to build some, you know, like you have to understand how it works visually in your mind, three-dimensionally. Um, and then, then when, you, when you've done that exercise, you have more the ability to put a building that is respectful of the land into it. Um, so for me, it's, it's the rigor, um, the rigor of understanding that would, uh, and then the other layer is the, the cultural layer, you know, like, is there some stories with that land and so forth, right? Okay, uh, thank you so much for the lecture. I have so many notes and so much to think about. Um, so uh, my question is about um, in urban settings and urban sites, um, how, how do you kind of do the connection to the land thing um, if you're in a city, if you're in such a we're we're dealing city. with that right now. Um, we're dealing with a a project in in Vancouver. Um, we're doing the rezoning for it. Um, it's on the corner of Hastings and Commercial Commercial Drive. Hastings runs into a pretty bad area of town, so it's sort of in a transitional zone. Um, and they have a lot of outdoor programming. So, um, you know, and there's a child care, a daycare center in there. So we're, we're looking up to vertical gardens and roof planes and, you know, like how do you bring nature into a vertical environment, right? You know, like we don't have Singapore where they have these wonderful hanging gardens and so forth on the buildings. But there is maybe ways of doing that. Like I'm talking to the city of Vancouver and I say, well, for affordable housing, you have this requirement for any any unit two or three bedroom to have a certain percentage of balcony space and yet you know often balcony space just get used to store their stuff on there right i'm saying well why can't we kind of group some of that area and carve out an area in the building and, and have like a four or five hundred square foot um garden um deck built carved into the building and uh so they're they're willing to look at that, but there's like how do you how do you kind of share that and then carve out space within an urban setting? And it's it's really you're now looking at the topology of your building. and type you know, the, the, your uh, your building becomes a landscape in some sense, right? And uh, especially in this area, because there's some uh, you know there's hesitancy of of having it at the ground level and plus you just have such a big program you can't do it you know like you you got 18 story towers and uh, a four story podium with a college and a, an association in it so you have to get creative so how do you carve out of that city to block to create some of those spaces um, and it could be as simple as operable windows or, or access to these outdoor spaces that are safe and inclusive. Plus they throw in the fact that they want an MBA regulation 
basketball court thrown into this block too. It's not an easy problem, but uh, so there are many different levels we're playing with that right now. Maybe I can ask one last question. Uh, following, uh, picking up on the question that was just asked, which is uh, when when we had our uh, lecture, uh, I guess it was the last lecture, we talked about sort of differences between the uh, urban indigenous population and then the population that was still uh, still more or less directly connected to the land, so on reserves or up north. And um, and there were two issues. One is, uh, well, three issues. One is that that urban indigenous population is not only bringing what their tradition with them, but they're also having to live among other people that don't share that tradition and figure out how those two worlds come together. Secondly, uh, that, that urban indigenous population is extremely diverse. It, it's Inuit, it's Métis, it's status Indian. And it's, it's not just one, it, it's, it's quite diverse. And so you can't necessarily fall, as you had in some of your projects, to figure out how to, to deal with it in a very generic sense. But the, I guess that, that question is um, one of the ones that I think about a lot is that, you know, how do, we, how do we use architecture and to what degree does the forms of architecture play into um, welcoming and embedding and accommodating larger and larger percentages of the indigenous population in our cities? I might just leave it at that as a question. <laughs> Again, that project is, is, a, is a challenge in that way because it is an urban environment. You have a lot of urban indigenous youth often displaced, often disconnected from their families. So I, I think it's the, the first thing is for a person to flourish, they must feel safe. For a person to learn, they must feel safe. So trying to create a, an environment within an urban context where everybody is given a chance and given some respect. So what does that look like? You know, like, um, you know, some people are shy, some people aren't. So, and then, and then having some, some opportunity um, and for sharing ideas and storytelling. And so the, the intergenerational um, importance of bringing elders in that connection to the community, I think is important for all indigenous people, no matter where they are. So in this project, the el there's always kind of a place for the elders, even though it's a college or it's an urban indigenous youth association so that the opportunity for storytelling because native people love they have this beautiful basic sense of humor and they like to laugh a lot and if you can create an environment that promotes that then you feel like you're a little bit more part of something and then then you open up it's like we're doing a, a homeless shelter and we're talking to the staff and they say some of these people are alcoholics around the street and they start cleaning up and you, you discover that they know beadwork or something. And then they're teaching everybody else and they start producing something. And then they have a start to have a sense of confidence and self-esteem. So there's many factors that you can do. It's just sometimes it comes down to just humans, basic human psychology, right? But creating a place that's safe. And it, it strikes me too, and maybe a little, a little reflected in the, in the work you've done, it, that universities uh, and colleges are a good place um, that allows that to happen. Yeah. Uh, uh, the sort of safe spaces and then the creation of some of these uh, centers on university campuses which really become these places where the two cultures can come together and yet a safe space into which you can retreat, find your own culture. Mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's a nice challenge for us as universities to think about. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, final questions, observations? So thank you so much again, uh, Alfred. Thank you very well, much for you. making the trip pleasure. and for sharing this work with us. And uh, this being the last lecture of our forum series this year, thank you all very much for your support and participation. And it's been just a, a pleasure to be able to come downtown and engage the community with the university here. Thanks.